Uh, our next speaker will be Justin Lessler. Yes, right. Lessler, good. From, uh, from the Bloomberg School at Johns Hopkins. Uh, and he, he will talk to us about uh, Fluescape. So, great. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about uh, Fluescape, uh, which is a, a cohort study that we have going in uh, southern China that uh, is really motivated in uh, the way it's asking questions and the questions it's asking by a lot of modeling work. So to some extent, it really makes this connection between, uh, or it's aiming to make this connection between data and model, data and models. And first, uh, talk a little bit about the motivation behind the project. Um, and so I'm ask you to take yourself back in time a little bit. It's 2005. And everybody is not so concerned about an H1N1 arising in Mexico, but is really concerned about an H5N1 coming, arising in Southeast Asia. Right, and trying to get funding. And trying to get funding. <laughs> so um, there were a lot. Of, there were a lot of these, uh, which are these massive agent-based models of, in this case, Thailand. Um, where they modeled everybody in Thailand, laid out with some density, and these people ran around, and uh, H5N1 emerged, they got infected, and it spread through, um, unless you caught it really, really early, red isn't actively infected, the green is recovered, it quickly you know, spread through over the course of here, 240 days, infects everyone in the country, and you have your global pandemic. And, um, you know, a lot of these were motivated by seeing if there was a way you could um, contain a global pandemic. And the end result was that uh, you could if you had enough antivirals and you caught it in the first, you know, 50 cases and threw, you know, a few tens of millions of dollars at it. Um, but this, this model has a bunch of individuals in it, and these individuals do things. Um, specifically, they go to work, they go to school, they travel, they travel some distance, and a lot of the questions about whether or not you're going to be able to contain the pandemic, whether or not this model works or is representative, is based on one of the, you know, is based on these functions. Um, and so that's one sort of motivating thing is this, there's this, all this work that's based on, on assumptions about human contact patterns with some measurement, but not a lot. Um, and just as a, side, a little more, the, in all of these, uh, this work that has measured human contact patterns hasn't been pairing it with disease outcomes as a general rule. I know, I know that's not universally the case, but in, as a general rule. And another is a more abstract observation. So if you take a stochastic SIR model, multi-patch model of influenza or some similar disease uh, that's you know, SIRS, that people recover at some rate, um, and you place uh, all your communities sort of on a line going out of decreasing connectivity and decreasing population density sort of going out from some central, large, urban, highly connected population. Um, you'll get epidemics in the large, highly connected urban population pretty much every year with a very simple stochastic model. With a, with a you know, deterministic model, you'll get things everywhere every year. Um, and, but as you move away to these less, you know, to these less connected, less dense populations, you're going to get less infections, and they're going to be missed. So this is sort of a basic result that all of our, from all of our modeling work, all of our patch models, that, you know, to the, um, hasn't really been verified with any empirical data. And then, um, this is motivation partially to do this and partially that it could be done. Um, so one is uh, Derek Smith wrote this, uh, and his colleagues wrote this very nice paper a while back, laying out where they took um, a bunch of strains of influenza, um, and they uh, took data on ferrets who'd been infected with one strain, and then they see 
how well, um, the, how much antibodies these ferrets have to another strain based on uh, hemagglutinate inhibition assays, hemagglutination inhibition assays. And using that, they lay out a map of cross reactivity and um, presumably also cross protection between strains based, based in this data. Um, and this, um, so this lets us know that, you know, this pattern both uh, represents something about cross protection and who's protected, but also it gives us hope that maybe in people's antigenic signature, in people's um, antibody reactions to various strains of influenza, the signal of their past infections may still be embedded. Um, and a slight related but slightly different train of work, um, you know, has shown that there are large, you know, and this is the reason for the placement of our study, there are large networks of interconnect, large interconnected populations with slightly different seasonalities throughout the uh, Southeast Asian region, um, where it's thought that influenza circulates year-round. And because influenza circulates year-round there, it can be a large driver of global antigenic diversity in influenza vir viruses. It's thought that you know, seasonal antigenic drifts often originate from this region. Um, and that, you know, so Southeast China uh, is a potentially very interesting place for understanding influenza transmission. So this led to us, um, my colleagues, uh, to come up with the idea for the Fluscape project. And, the, and the, had a, has a lot of goals, but a few of the major study goals are to add to the body of knowledge about human contact patterns, and specifically add to the body of knowledge about human contact patterns and their relationship, direct relationship to disease, to a, for a person-to-person -person, uh, transmitted illness like influenza as opposed to, say, a sexually transmitted disease where we know a lot more. It's a lot easier to define contact, for starters. Um, to test some fundamental hypotheses about the relationship between population structure and disease and incidence and see if we actually see evidence that these hypotheses, you know, that our hypotheses about the way the universe is working are actually holding in real populations. Um, characterize the relationship between known immune landscapes of the disease, the layout of immunity across space in, in a population and the future incidence of disease in that population. So given that population's prime susceptibility, what does the incidence of disease look in, like in that population? Um, and then understand the dynamics influenza that is in a region that is perhaps a driver of global influenza diversity. So this led us to design a study where, um, based in around Guangzhou in uh, southern China, so um, this is Hong Kong here, and so Guangzhou is about a two-hour train ride north. Um, I don't know how long it takes to get there any, from Hong Kong any other way, um, only taking the train. But, uh, and we took a, centering at Guangzhou, we picked a pie slice going out from the center of the city about uh, 75 kilometers. Um, in this shading here, this is uh, it's land scan data showing the population density. So darker is more dense. And here in Guangzhou, we're talking one of you know, the densest areas on the planet. We're talking Manhattan. And out here, you can see though it gets very non-dense very quickly. And we, we drew um, 40, or well, we ended up actually, we sampled more, but we ended up using 40 um, randomly sampled locations from that pie slice um, to, to conduct our study going across this population gradient and this gradient of presumed connectivity. Just to give you a sense of what the gradient looks like, and this, this is the center of Guangzhou, and this actually even, I need to find a better picture because this isn't even quite reflective of exactly how dense it is. You can get these large apartment buildings here. You can go to areas where it's just one after the other, after the other, after the other, for as far as you can see. Um, and this is out at the, you know, not even out at the very edges of our study site. This is our study team just 
traipsing through a farming village. And uh, this village there, you know, we met a man while we were there who hadn't left in 10 years. So very, at least apparently rural, um, over a very small, like, absolute distance scale. Uh, so in each of these locations, we sample 20 households. We randomly sample 20 households. And we go to each household, and we try to get as many people in the household to enroll in the study as possible. Um, and here, you know, and go to the door. We try to get people to, get to um, join. And we ask them, um, we do a couple things. First, we ask them in terms of uh, data collection about them. We ask them uh, demographic information about both their household and themselves. Um, and we ask them, perhaps most importantly, or most interestingly, about their contacts. When we give them this uh, contact diary, and I think we only have one Chinese speaker in the audience, so we're going to go to English. Um, and uh, so, so we, at, we go through, and um, you know, th and this is sort of similar to some of the stuff that was done in Polymod that was mentioned earlier, and some other of these um, big international contact surveys. Um, it does have some advantages. Um, which I'll get into, but we you know, ask them to describe a con the name of a contact as, as being an individual person or a group. You know, if it is a group, we want them to know the number of the people in the group. You know, age, whether the contact um, involved touch, uh, you know, what was the context of the contact, uh, where's the location, and this is something unique we do, is we got nominal locations, so named locations, and in our study staff, went out and actually found the GP, worked with the local community and found the actual GPS coordinates of the locations where the contacts take place. So we know actual, we have actual physical coordinates of every contact that a person has in one day. Um, you know, they, yes? How do you define contact work? For example, if they're on the subway. So face to face, sorry, face to face interaction. So a fa if I have a face to face interaction with you, like now, we've had contact. Me, you did not have contact with him. He can, sneeze on he can still sneeze on you, but some things just can't be helped. <laughs> <laughs> What's the context in which they're completing this? Uh, so this is, so we come to their house, and this is a interview, so we're talking about the day before his contact, and this is an interview led, inter, and this is important, this is an interviewer led contact survey. So it goes like this. So I say, Andrew, so you woke up yesterday, who's the first person you met? Uh, yesterday? Yeah. One of your students. And uh, okay, so so um, did you touch? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, nobody but, knows the answers to these questions, though. So how does that does that bother you? I mean, if you can um, ask this and they'll tell you things, but I will guarantee you that that accuracy of that information is not high. I have I gone. Have pledged that it is not high. You pledged it is not high. I pledge that it's a lot higher than you think it is. Um, I, I mean, we, you know, in the interviewer-led surveys, you know, and we've done, I've done this on people, and we've done it on each other, and it, it's pretty good. I mean, you're missing some. It's not perfect, but... Well, you're going to miss, I mean, certainly you're going to miss incidental contacts that we're not sailing to incidental. So you go to a store, and you buy something, and, you know, that, that's easily something you can forget. You'll miss things that were anomalous that you don't normally do, you don't think about. Right, but what we find, find is that by the interviewer leading it and going through the day, day sequentially, you catch a lot of those. So I think the... Oh, we, I mean, right, yeah, no, no, I think you, the you real... You have to do it this way. I mean, that's the way to do it. But. Right, I mean, I mean, we can't give moats to every, you know, uh, little proximity sensors mm -hmm. to every single person in southern China. No, no, I understand. I mean, I guess I'm, 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 I'm going to be very interested in, in terms of pushing it to see, you know, what, how dependent what you're doing is going to be on catching those things because the right. Well, the context, we, it's hard enough with with relation, one of the relationships to get right. But contacts are just the kind of things people are just not very good at. So right. I mean, we find that that with the interviewer, led, we have we have a lot of reasons to believe, and we'll get it to to it in a little later. Um, that the this is probably largely because of the interviewer did two things, the ability to name groups and the interviewer-led aspects of it. This is probably one of the best 
um, attempts at this. It? What? Have you ever tried to validate it? How? How? Well, you could use, you could take, not necessarily in that context, but you could take populations, you could use a combination of sensor, you could have people, you could have observers following them through a day. I mean, it's imperfect, but you could do things right. to, try to sort of try to get some validation. Well, we are going to do, um, actually, you know, actually sometimes, you know, between this and moats, sometimes this is maybe better. <laughs> but right, we we actually um, my two of the collab my collaborators in this have a stu new study that they're doing in schools where they will be doing some of the validation. I think that would be very interesting. Yeah. Do you have? So what do you do when you have sort of these loose ends that you don't have any other information on? So the reason you're not giving all these numbers is because literally, I mean, I could maybe meet four people that who have the most and then a hundred who don't. But right. you're not actually tracking each one of these people. So you have a lot of loose ends here in these, in these trees. So, so we're not getting, we're not getting second level structure, right? We're not giving my contacts, we're not finding who my contacts know. And actually in the new, in the, in the year two data collection, we are asking if people think other contacts have met each other. So we are trying try making some really half-assed attempt at getting that. But we're, you know, we're just getting my um, egocentric contacts, right? So of people outside of almost everybody, I mean, we're, we're sampling in a, you know, 18, 1,800 people out of a transect that probably has 3 million. So the, you know, they, you know, we're not, everybody, they, most of the people they meet are not going to be in this stuff. Right. Well, ultimately, hopefully, when we get to the point when um, we're pairing this with disease outcomes, we'll find out that, that, that it does have some predictive power, which would indicate that it probably gave something. But yes, I mean, there's every chance that a null result out of this was all because of fuzziness in the data collection. I, I, I grant that, assuredly. Um, we get a lot of information about the context. Let's move on. Um, and then we also ask everybody for blood. Um, and we get five milliliters of blood. And what we're going to do with that is we're going to do uh, 1,400. Out of 1,800. Out of 1,800. Plus or minus. So to, for your household to be enrolled. You show up at my door, you want my blood? Well, this is, US, this is United States, not China, for starters. I mean, there are a lot of cultural differences. So we show up, well, one is we're not, we show up at your house. We, you know, our study has been introduced to your community by the Street Village Committee, um, for starters. And then um, if your house, for your house to be enrolled at all, you have, somebody in the house has to give blood. At least one person in the house has to give blood. Um, and then um, we pay you a little bit more. But, I mean, not only more. Um, so, so uh, Justin, how often is blood taken from these participating? Once a year. Thank you. So spaced out by a year. And we've only done one year of, so, so we're right now in the process of, year, of analyzing year one data. So, probably about 70% of what I have here will present is actually going to be from the pilot study. Currently, we're collecting year two data, so we're getting the paired serologies, which is going to be huge because that allows us to have action. Like here, we have to sort of look through a glass darkly and say, okay, maybe these antibody profiles represent incidents, maybe not. And, right, and, and the old flu hands will say, oh, no way in hell. And, the new flu hands will say, eh, maybe. <laughs> so, um, the, uh, um, so, right, so, so, but as of, we'll get a lot more information after the second year of data collection, because not only will we know, will we have paired serologies, which are at, give us actual incidents, but we'll know a lot more about people's, how people's titers change on individual infections. And, and maybe one more question. Um, how did you sample these people? Can you so randomly can you select these people up to, to be representative of what? 
Um, they're pretty representative of the population of China according to the census, and we'll get to that. Um, so, okay, so neutralization titers. Uh, essentially, all you need to know is that there's two types, uh, hemagglutination inhibition assay, which is fast, cheap, standardizable, but a little bit fuzzy. Neutralization titers, which are expensive, hard to standardize across labs, but seem to be a little bit more specific. Um, and you read them like that. Uh, so, so let's talk about uh, some results from the study. Uh, so yeah, so this is thing. So we, within the households that participated in the study, and um, we, there were uh, 3,050 individuals. Um, so, but those are people who nominally live there. Um, and some of those people would be away working, some of those people would be too young, some of those people just don't want anything to do with us. So that's where we got our 1,800 some study participants. Um, and all of these people filled out a quest contact questionnaire or filled out a, you know, and a you know, personal demographic questionnaire. Um, and a fairly high percentage of those people provided blood. Um, so, and this is, goes to your representativeness question. So the, in both of these graphs, the bars are our study, the distribution from our study, and the lines are the distribution from the census. Um, and we have, it looks like our population matches the population of China according to the census, or of this region of China according to the census, pretty well with two exceptions. We miss the youngest children, um, which is unfortunate because in some sense they're the people we're most interested in, in, but it's also expected because like you say, while you may not give me blood when I show up at your door, you're definitely not letting me take it from your two-year-old. Um, so, um, and households, the smallest households, we undersampled as well because of, you know, as you might expect, if you show up, people are less likely to be home. Um, even though in any household in our randomized list, we did try to visit multiple times before dropping them. Um, so, start talking about some contacts. Um, and this is our first result for um, contacts. And this is just showing that if, so contacts that people say they have um, during uh, the day is pretty flat by age. It doesn't actually seem to vary that much by age in terms of named contacts. But um, if, you, if you put in involving touch, it actually is the case that children are having many, many more contacts or claiming to have many, many more contacts involving touch than adults. Um, and here, just, just to say we got in terms of how many contacts we got named, we got 33,821 contacts named. The person with the, uh, who named the most contacts named 642 contacts. Um, and there's the strong indication of the power law distribution. It's not a power law. It's curving. <laughs> okay. It's, all right. It's curving. All right. That's not a power law. All right. Not, okay, not a power law. I'll, yeah, just say heavy tail, and then you're safe. But that's, heavy heavy that's tail, okay. Law. Power law-esque. Okay, that wasn't my decision to call it that, so I'm not going to try to defend it. <laughs> um, but one of the things that, when you compare it to other studies, is you tend to get um, the, these curves, you'll tend to get a truncation somewhere around here. Um, that by allowing people to name groups of contacts, so if you have shopkeepers and stuff who can just sort of name the people who came to their shop as a grand unit, you get less of the, you know, less truncation at the tail. So it sort of improves the right hand tail. So like if the person was on a plane, how many contacts do you get that? Well, it's face-to-face -face contact. So if a person's on the plane, you probably contacted the stewardess, you may be contacted with the person sitting next to you, maybe one or two other people. You don't want to count people within six rows of seats or something? No. That, that's not what we're defining contact up for the purpose of the study, which is partially a practical issue. Um, I mean, it's a part, depending on, you know, how, what the type of transmission you're concerned with, it may or may not be a biological issue. If you're, if you're thinking, 
you know, highly aerosolized transmission, yeah, I need to get everybody in this room as a contact, right? But if we're talking large, but it's flu, right? So if we're talking large droplet transmission, it's okay, you know, we probably need so to be looking. Right, something. so, you know, we can't get the very indirect fomites, but the part of the reason we're asking about touch is because we're interested in sort of, you know, direct fomites, I guess. <laughs> I don't know how we'd want to term that, but you know, right, direct, con direct con So was Sean the different form then? Because everyone on one floor of a hotel got it, so that was, so that was fundamentally different. Right, well that event, right, I mean yeah, that yeah. one event, yeah. like I, you know, I think there's some question about how generalizable that is. I mean, I think SARS, I'm not an expert on SARS, so I don't want to say, say much about it, but you know, like there can be huge, like there's the uh, Kate, Alaskan Airlines case uh, for flu, where is it 1979, I think? I think the paper was published 76, 77. 76, 77, but there, there was a plane grounded and 75 people got the flu from one person, one infected individual. And um, flu epidemiologists love this because it tells us most of our information about the incubation period of flu. But um, it's, like it's not typical. It's not typical. In any number of ways. Right, yes. It's a very, it's very, it's very, very odd occurrence. But it's not in the Hotel M thing, thing, the Hotel M thing in SARS is discrepant from the rest of the transmission of the body of the transmission literature for SARS. And SARS, while it's another um, negative strand RNA virus, is not flu. Um, the transmission does not appear to be exactly the same. And of course, things like the incubation period um, and serial interval are different for those two viruses. All right, so um, and this is a another just another contact result, and here we're just comparing it roughly uh, with uh, simulation work um, from Eubank, um, Steve Eubank, and folks. Um, and this is our mean number of contact, mean number of contact locations per individual. And you get a similar distribution here, though you have not many people going out. Sorry, which was on the left, which was your data? The, the data's on the right. Our data's on the right. The left is from, the left is from a simulation. You have the same slope? Um, I have not calculated, but I, I think their slope is actually slightly different because they, they go out much higher than our data actually goes. We're maxing out at around 100. Do you have any idea what's causing lower tail discrepancy? Is that interesting? Um, I think it's interesting. I mean, I, I do think this seems a little um, this seems a little big to me. Yeah. You know, in time, you know, I, I, I think yeah, there, I, th I think there is some sort of upper limit, given the transportation infrastructure of wherever you're at, there's some upper limit of um, how many contacts you can potentially make in a day. Oh, yeah. And there's also the fact that, that, I mean, the people who maybe would be at this upper tail, like, I mean, there's some chance the people who maybe would be like a delivery driver or something, may be very unlikely to actually be captured. You know, there are certain, I mean, one of the, you know, fundamental flaws, you know, or problems with doing something like this empirically is there are certain types of people, um, migratory workers, people who have jobs that keep them out of the house very, very long during the day that we are not going to get any direct data, though we may get secondary data. I was thinking of the lower tail. I mean, oh, you were thinking, you were yeah, thinking you this were, discrepancy. You were sort of, sort of low contact cases and their, their tail didn't slope, slope down as much. And so one question, for instance, is that, I mean, is that real on the one end or another possibility is, is that a, they are in fact in there. Are these a lot of these sort of incidental contacts, mm -hmm. you know, one of like again, I guess you a storekeeper, you walk in, you talk to that person once. Those are things that are not what people would be remembered. Mm -hmm. So it'd be interesting to know is that is that error or is that real? It may not matter, but it right. would be interesting to know. Yeah. I mean and maybe these people don't actually answer the door. Yeah. <laughs> um so this is the uh, distribution of contacts in terms of you know, with no tying to their origin location, um, you know, as, you know, as you might expect, most of them happen during, uh, within the city, there's another sort of dense city down here where a lot of people are having their contacts. 
even within, you know, looking at the previous day, you do get people having contacts, you know, pretty far away within China. So we are capturing some people who are coming back from long trips and the like. And um, yeah, so, and then another question we ask people, and this gets to sort of secondary information that may, maybe helps us get some information about how household looks uh, that we, you know, when we can't talk to everybody in it, is we ask, you know, members of the household, what's the furthest a member of the household traveled in the past seven days and in the past year? Um, and so you tend to get the people in these more urban centers near the Guangzhou do seem to tend to have travel, have had people in short term who've traveled further. Um, the traveling distance in general gets a lot longer when you go to a year. Uh, one thing the, about um, China is that a lot of the really long distance casual travel all happens within uh, a about two to three week period around the Lunar New Year that is never going to be um, just because when we can do our data collection is never going to be in the past seven days. So it's captured here. Um, and so, you know, part of, as I said, part of the point is to look at this data. So that's our description of contacts and look at this data in um, conjunction with outcome data. And here is all of the 1,400 people who gave um, blood in our study and their neutralization titers to um, some strain, you know, to some various historical influenza strains. Or is, these are actually HI titers, sorry. These are HI titers. Um, the, um, they're grouped by location. Locations are ordered by distance from Guangzhou. And the um, and darker means higher tighter, um, and people are ordered by age in there. Um, but let's break that down a little bit because I'm not going to ask you to magically inter interpret all that. Um, so, but well, one of the first things you notice in this is okay. So these are older strains, and these are younger people, and you can see within a lot of locations. That there's little age, you know, that there's one, of course, prominent age effect of people not having much tighter to things they weren't alive to um, be exposed to. But it also turns out that age is one of the predominant factors dictating what your titer to a particular strain is going to be. And if, so if we're going to interpret differences between locations at all, we have to deal with age. So I'm going to talk about, a little bit about dealing with age. Um, and I'm going, you know, and on the pilot data, we, you know, to get at this, we did a, we looked at a long historic series of strains for H3N2, um, going all the way back to when it emerged in 1968 up to local strains circulating uh, the year before our pilot data collection. Um, so the ones in light blue are the ones we tested against. Um, and here is a, since it's pilot data and only 151 people, a much simplified version of that graph I showed earlier. Um, and so you can see this white triangle here, um, and that's people who were not alive to be exposed to a particular strain of the flu. Um, and then you can see that there are, appear to be some definite differences between overall exposure to different strains, um, and that there seem to be some age trends. So we can look at this a slightly different way, and, and we'll zoom in on this in a second. Um, looking at, so here's by age groups, here's all the data by points, and I think I zoom in on this immediately, so let's just go to a subset of it. Um, but he, so here, you can see that you know for these three strains, one is you can see that there's a definitely strong trends by age in your titer to the individual strains. In fact, it is the single most strongest predictor of what your titer is going to be. Um, but one thing that's interesting is that if you align people's ages not by the age that they are when we came and saw them, but the age that they were when the strain first circulated, 
that we have almost exactly the same curve for every single strain. The peaks, it's, everything's going to be H3 and 2 for, for the next little bit. Um, Let's go back to that for a second. Sorry. Uh, the, 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 the Hong Kong 68, that's the pandemic strain, basically. Yes. And the, the two graphs look like, I mean, isn't that just the same data? Or, or I mean, what, uh, this one and this one? Yeah, 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 yeah it's just time shifted. So this oh, is the see. same data, but here, this is their age at their time that we came up and knocked on their door. Okay, right. And this is their age at when, okay. you know, to be very specific, when the strain was isolated, presumably when it was circulating. Right. Okay. We don't understand your statement. What looks the same? <laughs> what curves look the same? Yeah. Here. You can control for age. The, uh, yeah, she can't see these. These, so this is the, these are the, ti you know, these is the mean titer at a given age, and they all, um, it's, it's more striking when you... So those three curves look similar. Right, they look very similar, right? They peak at the same age. Um, and if you, you know, I don't know that you can really see it, but if you look across them all... The year olds have the best peak. Is that what you're saying? Um, no, because it's not the time when you were, it's the time that you, age you are, because this is not the age, this is, this is the age you are now. Right? This is the age you were when the strain circulated. So it's not that being 18 now gives me the highest titers. It's being, well, actually seven years old when the strain circulated. Um, so, so just, just to, to go, go through it a little bit, um, you, know, we, you know, we can think of a few models to um, try to explain this. Um, one is just that there's an age effect that is dependent on each strain. Every strain has its own, own independent relationship with age, sort of your null model. Uh, one is that there is an age effect that is strain independent and has two components. Um, each strain gets its own intercept, but w after that intercept, there are two components. There's my age at time of testing like I said, in my age at time when the strain was circulating, which is there. And then another model that we might have is that, in, um, is that each individual has their own intercept because some individuals are high responders and some individuals are low responders. Um, but it's this second model <coughs> that is the um, you know, most parsimonious description of the data and has the best line. Um, the S, it's just a spline. It's, it's indicating that it's a spline term. So, so this is a spline of... But in the one below, you don't have a spline. Um, oh, because there's only one S in that one. <coughs> so that's it. Right. But th this is... To cut to the chase, this is, this is the result. Um, and so I don't have this one rescaled, but this is... You see here, this is age of time... Isolation and that has the strongest effect, potential effect, um, more than end of strain and more than age at time of testing, that on the um, relative log titer that I'm likely to have to a particular strain. It's my age when that strain was isolated, with seven years old being the peak. Um, there being some tail here um, that goes into people who weren't yet born when it was happening, but that's probably a signature of cross-reactivity. And this smooth decline as I get older. There's this other phenomena that um, shows up that's a little, that's, that's more subtle and a little harder to explain, is that people who are old when we met them have high titers to everything, or, or tend to have higher titers to everything, a little bit higher titers to everything. Did they get vaccinated? No, hardly anybody here has been vaccinated. Not even the older people? Even the older people. No, but what they do have is probably four or five, eight previous infections with H3 and 2 strains, and they have greater cross reactivity. Right. You, yeah, so I mean, that's right, one that's one possible explanation. Right? Old flu would <laughs> say that's cross reactivity. Right, that, 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 that's, the gen, that's a generalized influence, right, generalized H3 into immunity, right. Um, Why does it pick up at 60? Yeah. 
Yeah. I, I, my 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 fa my favorite ex explanation of this. I mean, in 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 the trend, it starts trending up at 60. It's it's really strong in these guys, and there aren't a ton of those people. Um, no, even in China. And, in, in the and this is in the 151 people. In the 1400 people, um, this trend is still there. Still, you know, I'm still. It's not quite ready for prime time yet, but. Um, this trend is a little. I'm not sure if it's there yet or not. Could um, be a selection effect. Uh, that yeah, that's my favorite theory. Is it's survival. Like, it's a survival like the people who, who were bias. Really good responses survived the age. Right. So yeah. So that that's my favorite theory. But I but I think but the Justin, old. Will you? I don't know if you're going to have. I mean, this is fantastic data, by the way. All right. I mean, are you, do you think you're going to have enough funding to? to have some of these people age into some of these <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> we, five or ten years. No, we, we are absolutely trying to, you know, this nothing. Some really fundamental questions no, really nothing's fun. hit yet, but if you have any ideas that might help us get some <laughs> <side> funding, <laughs> we would be love to hear them. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we're trying hard. Like right now, we only have enough money for next year. We can probably beg, borrow, and steal to do another year. Yeah, to get five years minimum. Yeah, no, we want to do. We want to get like seven, um, in in different locations. Um, so uh, this is just to show that that model fits the nice little purple line really, really well. Um, <laughs> so, so pot. So, so let's let's just jump back a second. So so th this little trend here. Um, you know, just just to poke at all the old flu hands in Francis, I'm going to call anagenic seniority, <laughs> not original anagenic sin. <laughs> but uh, because it's a smooth, because it's a smooth thing that happens over time. Um, and maybe I'll go through this pretty quickly because I want to get back to more original results. But there are a few. Um, possible ways you might explain this. Cross reactivity would be one, because um, there is, you know, a lot of cross reactivity between clusters of the strains. Um, so sorry, I, I don't understand. Why does that imply seven-year-old who has the strongest response? It, but but you could say, I mean, you need to postulate some. But I could be, I could only get infected once around school age, and then everything else could be cross reactivity. Right. I mean, that's. You know, or maybe twice, right? But then you'd expect this to be symmetric. Strawman, strawman. <laughs> um, Age-specific contact. This is uh, what from uh, the Masang Polymod paper. Um, and you know, this is the curve of attack rates they kind of expected to see from a newly introduced virus, and it isn't completely dissimilar from our curve, but. Um, but I don't. I don't believe it. <laughs> um, so I think it's it's sort of an expansion on this original on this you know older idea of original antigenic sin. And you know we you know we got excited about our result, and then we go back and we look through you know go pour through the old literature, and lo and behold, the exact same graphs from 1956. <laughs> Or, or very similar graphs. Um, this is much cruder, and you know these these are far more different. The strains here are far more different, but you do see similar patterns. Um, and this idea of original antigenic sin, the idea of the first strain I get exposed to in my life having some pr primacy in my immune response, came out of um, came out of that. Um, and there's been a lot of evidence. Yeah, or or that I happen to, or that on average people, and I know there's data to support that your first infection is a lot younger. But on you know another interpretation would be on average, I'm getting my first strain around somewhere near the time I come to school, or getting my first really vigorous flu infection. Um, and you know there's a lot of laboratory data to sort of support at least that there's a relationship between strains. For instance, even across major subtypes. Here, H, um, H3N2, H2N2, and H1N1, that when I get infected with a subsequent strain, 
um, that it, and I like this data a little better, and this, this is great because this is like 1941. This is our neutralization titers where we're actually killing mice with our, with, um, with the non-neutralized stuff. Um, so this, um, but the idea being that when I get infected with a new strain, I, um, you know, my antibody response to a strain I was infected, or, well, let me step back. So the first strain I get infected with gets the most senior slot. And when a new strain comes in, it boosts my antibody response to the thing with the more senior slot, and the existence of the more senior slot sort of dampens that immune response to that strain too. And then he takes in the next most senior spot. And then, um, you know, then, then the next most senior strain comes in. Oh, five minutes, all right. And so we cooked up some, mo I have some model that I haven't put any parameters on yet, but it's a conceptual model that I'm working with. But let's get to locations because that, that's the really exciting thing. Um, so in the pilot data, um, so going to the pilot data, once you've adjusted for age and everything else, um, in the pilot data we only had five locations. There's one location, location five, and this is the unadjusted data. Um, and this is the percent with detect, proportion with detectable titers, that's neutralization titer over 10. Uh, they um, consistently, location five, had higher detectable titers than every other location for all the strains we tested. Um, and um, you can sort of see it here in an adjusted model. Um, and we published it. Um, and, but this is for, this is the more exciting result. This is for the entire study, a similar adjusted model. Um, and, the, and here we're assuming, kind of based on those early results, that each location has a intercept for just like generalized H3N2 flu. Um, and this is looking at the only the H3N2s. You, you see the exact same graph if you do H1N1s. But um, a generalized H3N2 like susceptibility or, or tighter level, right? And so the larger the orange circle here, the, um, you know, the higher the titers to in that location regardless of the strain of H3N2 going back. This is over five strains going back from 1968 to 2008. Um, and, you know, nicely for some of your, you know, kind of the crude hypotheses, sees this, the largest responses, the largest average titers are in the most urbanized areas. Um, and the lowest titers are in these really, really remote places. So none of your locations were near a pig farm? Um, there were some pigs. Um, I, I didn't see any industrial, I don't know about industrialized pig farming, but there's a fair amount of, um, fair amount of backyard pig farming, much more, many, many more chickens. Did you but, see any of that in your data? Um, we, ha we do have the stuff to look at it. Um, we haven't looked at it yet. Um, this is you know, fairly hot off the presses. Um, but that is absolutely one of the things we want to look at. And we may go back and test against actually some direct slime strains. Um, here, here's the same. Here's just throwing roads on that. Um, there is some patterning in here. So, the, so it does look like there is some sort of density gradient, but the patterning is definitely more intricate than that. Um, I mean, it's suggestive that maybe there's some patterns. It could be that there's really dense, really remote, and everything in between is just random. But um, very retreat. intriguing results there. Um, and we will skip all of this stuff. You can look at the pretty colors. Um, so in the future, like I said, we're getting paired serologies so that we can actually measure incidence, um, which will be very nice. Uh, we, we would like, we're trying to recruit sites in temperate regions so that we can compare patterns in a region where we think there's at least, you know, at least some circulation all the time from a pattern where the sense where there may be circulation all the time, but the seasonality is far, far more pronounced. Um, even in the low population density areas here, you, you, it's pretty rapid to get to a, very, very, a fairly dense place. Even though these villages appear very rural, 
you know, they're pretty rapid to get into um, a denser area, so we'd like to go to even more rural locations, to recruit some even more rural locations. And then finally, uh, looking at virus and looking at the, doing virological surveillance, we look at the dynamics of vir virus in a population where we know their baseline immune profile, which is, you know, I think has the potential to really open up some interesting questions. Um, there's a number of people to thank. Uh, Derek is the P, Derek Cummings is the PI of the the overall PI of the study. Uh, Dr. Zhang uh, takes care of all the data collection at Guangzhou Hospital Number no. Twelve in China. Yi Guang does all of our um, virus testing. Various other luminaries and people who do hard work on the ground, and obviously our funding. Um, and here's everybody looking relatively happy. And, and many organizations. So I rushed through to get through, done in time, and then all the questions had already been asked. <laughs> so you, you have just collected the second? So right now, we're about halfway through the second year of data collection. So um, through various reasons, bureaucratic reasons that won't be done until probably May. Do you have um, uh, a sense of uh, the attrition rates between the first and second wave? It's not that bad. Maybe um, 10 to 20 percent, um, but we're recruit, you know, recruiting well. The, there, there are some locations, so this is um, what happens when you have um, a do stuff in a place with very centralized planning is there are some locations that have just been moved. <laughs> there is an urban redevelopment, you know, there's an urban redevelopment project there, and so everybody has been moved, and they're all gone. So we have two locations like that. <laughs> Supposedly, they, everybody gets the chance to have a free apartment or something, or not a free, but get an apartment in the new area once the urbanization program is happened in two or three years, so they could be a very interesting population to try to come back in contact again, if that's possible, if they decide to come back. But Does that provide opportunities if you have a new group all of a sudden? Yeah, well, we're going to try to get a new, well, we won't have a new people there in t for a couple of years while they're building. But yeah, they're, but what we're doing is going and finding the next closest area, next closest uh, street or village committee, and recruiting from their area. And finally, <coughs> Justin, this is a great opportunity. Um, <coughs> hope you get some extended funding. Um, it would be really interesting <coughs> to think about doing a vaccine effectiveness or a vaccine efficacy study on top of this, mm -hmm. um, this, this cohort where you're going to understand immunity. Um, yeah, I think, I think that would be, be very, very interesting. Um, and also, I think we're going to have, um, you know, after, right, so this, this happened, um, you know, first year data collections like mid-pandemic, pilot is before pandemic. And I think we're going to get a little bit higher, you know, we were looking at like 5 or percent vaccine uptake. I think it's going to be higher in these later years. So, so that's both an opportunity and a challenge. It makes it harder to interpret our data, but it also, we get to look at how well it worked. So, anything else? Uh, five minute break. <laughs>